I just have just have one passage of scripture I'd like to read. Um, if you have a Bible with you, turn with me, please, to um, the book of Isaiah and chapter number 53, please. And if you don't have a Bible with you, don't worry. Um, we'll try to read it as loud and clear as possible. We'll just take time to read the whole chapter. It's more important than anything I could have to say upon it. So Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he hath done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And we know that God will add a blessing to the reading of his precious word. Now just, if you, want to keep your, if you want to keep your Bible open at Isaiah chapter 53, where we've just read, I might be referring back to it a number of times. So the chapter we've just read is possibly one of the, the best known in the Bible. I remember right from I was only four or five years of age, I remember learning it at Sunday school. And there's probably many here in the car park this afternoon could speak upon it much better than I could. And I'll be honest, when I was preparing for this meeting, I didn't really know what I was going to speak on. I thought about it long and hard and thought, should I give a word and should I tell my testimony or should I, what should I speak on? And I really, I really wasn't sure. And Isaiah 53 is just where I settled. And I've tried to divide this chapter up into four small sections. And my reason for, my reason really, I think that I've settled myself in Isaiah chapter 53 as that whatever way I tried to divide the chapter up, the, reoccur the reoccurring theme of the chapter was that the innocent Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, died in the place of guilty sinners such as you and me. Now, I've divided I've divid the chapter up into four sections, as I've said, and the first, the first small section I've divided up into is, is verses 1 to 3. And really, the, he the, the title or the heading I've put over those three verses is the sorrowing servant. In verse 2, it tells us of how the nation of Israel saw absolutely no beauty in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ. While he was here on this earth, there was absolutely nothing that as they looked upon him, there was, nothing that, there was nothing that drew them to him. Despite the fact that he was, he was God, he was verily God, yet become truly human. He was God manifest in flesh, yet... There was nothing different about his physical character. He was truly human. He was truly man. And when, when the nation of Israel understood what was demanded of them, I just want you to consider how that they treated the sorrowing servant. We read, 
in verse number three, he is despised and rejected of men. The nation of Israel despised the person of the, that, that, or the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. They put a price on him. One of the Lord Jesus' disciples, Judas, sold him. They put a cheap price on him of 30 pieces of silver. Verse 3 also tells us, And as we hid, as it were, our faces from him, when the Lord Jesus Christ was in their presence, they turned their faces from him. They didn't want to be seen with him. They didn't want to be associated with him. When he was in their presence, they turned their faces from him and looked elsewhere. They didn't want, they didn't want anything to do with him. The Lord Jesus didn't represent the things that were important to, to the nation of Israel, such as reputation, pampering themselves, social prestige and wealth. And these things were of no importance to Christ. The, only, the reason the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world first and foremost was to obey the will of his Father. And you know, as I thought about those verses and how the nation of Israel treated the Lord Jesus, I just thought to myself, modern society is very much the same today and sin is so prevalent in our world. You know, as we consider those round about us, we see people and what they strive for are the things of this world. They want to have the most money. They want wealth. They want the best cars. They want to have the most cars. They want to have the biggest houses. They want to have the designer clothes. They want social media attention. It's got to the point in our world where people are so vain and so full of themselves that even if people put a, so a post up on social media, if it doesn't reach a certain number of likes, they almost feel that people are against them and people don't like them and they'll, they'll take it down from social media. We're so full of self. And yet, that was the, those, are, those reasons I've just described are some of the reasons why the people in the nation of Israel all those years ago rejected and despised the Lord Jesus Christ. So move on to the next section, the next three verses, four to six. Really, the title I've put over that is the smitten servant. So we've moved from the sorrowing servant to the smitten servant. And this is really the section of the Isaiah chapter 53 that presents the heart of the gospel. I'm just going to take time to read those three verses again. And really what I want you to, what I want you to look out for, or listen for, is the use of the word are and we, talking about us. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our, of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we, we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And you know, that, what, what we read there in verse number five, just that, just that line, he was, he was bruised for our iniquities. And really, with the suffering that the Lord Jesus endured on Calvary's cross and how the, how the people treated him and how he, was, how he was mocked and he was whipped and he was beaten and he was scourged, of course he was bruised, but it's not just that he was bruised, but he was crushed. The original meaning of that word bruised is really, really means that he was crushed. And you might say, well, that sounds, that sounds very dramatic or that sounds very over the top. What do you mean by he was crushed? And really what it means is that he was crushed by the burden of sin. And there's a verse in Psalm chapter 38 and verse 4 in which David speaks and he says, For mine iniquities are gone over my head. As a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. And you know, as I was thinking of that, David was just one man. He was only burdened for his own sin. And those were sins that he committed himself. And yet the Lord Jesus was crushed by the burden of sin. And that was not sins that he committed. That was the sins of you and I. That was the sins of those who were around him and lived with him at that time. Those were the sins that you've committed. Those were the sins that I've committed. So if, you, if we read that verse again that David speaks concerning himself as a heavy burden, they, his sins, are too heavy for me. How must the Lord Jesus have felt with that burden of sin upon him? But if you read on down 
in verse number six, the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that was really the burden that the Lord Jesus had. He knew all that lay before him, and yet he turned not back. And verse number five, but he was wounded for our transgressions. As I've already made mention of, the Lord Jesus Christ was not wounded for his own transgressions or for his own sins or for his own iniquities. It was for your transgressions and my transgressions that he was there. He couldn't have died for his own sins. And the reason he couldn't have done that is because he couldn't sin. In him, there was no sin. He, it, is, it was impossible for him to sin because he was God. He was God manifest in flesh. It was, it was impossible for him to sin. And so he was wounded for our transgressions. And that title that I've put over these three verses, The Smitten Servant, just as we consider what the Lord Jesus endured, and as we think about what man did to him, man poured out their worst upon him. They hated him. They pierced his feet and his hands with nails. They pierced his side with a spear. They placed a crown of thorns on his brow and beat it into his head. They whipped his back. They spat on his face. They plucked the hairs from off his face. And to think that the Lord Jesus Christ endured that for your sin and for mine. But it wasn't just the physical sufferings and the physical punishment that he endured. But in those dark hours on Calvary's cross, in those, dark, in those hours of darkness, the Lord Jesus endured the wrath of God on account of sin. And just it impressed upon my mind that, that section in verse 5, just the last line, and with his stripes we are healed. With his stripes we are healed. And that really brings me on to the next, my next section, which is verses 7 to 9. And just over those three verses, really what I've, how I've really termed that or put a heading over that is the silent servant. And the sufferings that I've mentioned that the Lord Jesus Christ were, were totally, totally undeserved. You know, that was man really that poured out their worst upon him. And, you know, as you think about it, why? Why did they hate him? Why did they do those things to him? It was totally undeserved. The malefactors on either side of him, on his left and on his right, they were there for their own sins. They deserved to die. But Christ was sinless. And never once did he open his mouth. Of all that he endured, never once did he put up any defense. Never once did he speak and say, I'm innocent, I don't deserve this. He, was, he never once opened his mouth in defense. And as you, as you read through the story of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus, he had many, many opportunities to defend himself. And just as I was reading different accounts of the, different gospel accounts of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus, he was silent before Caiaphas. He was silent before the chief priests. He was silent before the elders. He was silent before Pilate. And he was silent before Herod. And even as the soldiers mocked him and scourged him and they whipped him and they beat him, never once did he open his mouth. He was totally silent. He was in subjection to the Father's will. But not only was he silent when he endured these physical sufferings, but also when he was illegally tried. And as you well know, in today's courts, if it can be proved that something in the trial is illegal, the case must be tried again. And everything about the Lord's trial was completely illegal. They hated him without a cause, yet he opened not his mouth. And you might ask, and rightly so, well, if the Lord Jesus Christ was innocent and he was there on account of sins for, that were not his own, why did he not say something? Why did he not defend himself? And in, John, in John's gospel, in chapter number 18, in verse number 11, the Lord Jesus said to Peter, The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? And really what that means is, the Lord Jesus didn't oppose anything that the nation of Israel did to him. He didn't oppose any of it. 
He was in subjection to it all. He knew all that lay before him. Yet he opened not his mouth. He knew that it was the Father's will that he should suffer. And yet he opened not his mouth. And just, I'll read verse 7 to you. Again, I'm going to read as many of these verses as I can just because it's more important than anything I could say. But verse number 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. And really, that just brings me on to the last section, verses 10 to 12. So from the very start, the first section, we had the sorrowing servant. Verses 4 to 6, we had the smitten servant. Verses 7 to 9, we had the silent servant. And what I've just put over the last three verses, number, or verses 10 to 12, is the satisfied servant. And if we read, if we read verse 10, it, you'll see that God himself was satisfied. It pleased God the Lord to bruise him. The Lord Jesus Christ was God's only begotten son and yet it pleased him to bruise him. And you might think that is a strange thing, but if you, were an I, if you and I were ever to be in heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ was the only one who could ever have borne our sin. And yet we read here in verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. And in verse number 11, this is, really, this is really God himself speaking. It's God speaking of his son. It's God speaking of Christ. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. My righteous servant justify many. And if you don't remember anything else that I say, just remember this, the only way to have your sins forgiven is through the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing you can do that, can save, that you can do to save yourself. There's no good works that you can do. There's, not, there's no amount of money you can give. You could give millions and billions of pounds if you could, and it would make no difference. There's no feelings that you can have or no emotions that you can go through that can save you doesn't matter how kind or how good a person you are. It doesn't matter how many church services you attend or what your place of worship is and how loyal and how faithful you are to it. You could quote the Bible from cover to cover and you wouldn't be one step closer to heaven. The only way to heaven is to have your sins forgiven through the person of thy son, the Lord Jesus Christ and his precious blood that he shed on Calvary. And you know, if those things that I've just mentioned could save you, why, why would the Lord Jesus Christ have had to come into this world? Why did he have to die? Why would, had, why would he have had to shed his precious blood? Why would God put his son through all that if you could just be saved by turning over a new leaf? If you could just give money, if you could just be the best person you could be, if you could just attend church, why, why did the Lord Jesus have to die? Why would God put his son through that? And verse number 12 says, And he bare the sin of many. You see, by you and your works and everything you can do and everything you can give, that does nothing for your sin. That will never take away sin. The Lord Jesus Christ has bore your sins. He's bore my sins. If he hadn't bore my sins, I wouldn't be standing here today. And just as, I, just as I come to a close, could I just ask you to consider your sin? You know, what, what do you think of your sin? I would, I would encourage each and every person who's not saved to just read this chapter to themselves and think about it. And just read of the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you think of your own, even think of the last 24 hours or the last seven days, you couldn't count how many times you've sinned. And it was your sin that held the Lord Jesus on Calvary's cross. And just as you think every time you sin, that that was the reason that the Lord Jesus died on Calvary's cross, how it should humble you. 
to think that he would love you enough to come into this world. He left heaven. It's not that he was born on this earth and that was his, that was his beginning. He left heaven. He left God's side. He left the splendors of heaven. He was born as a babe in Bethlehem. And he lived a life where he was despised and rejected of men. All with a view to going to Calvary's cross to shed his precious blood on account of sin. Just consider the suffering that the Lord Jesus Christ endured on Calvary's cross. And just forget about everybody else's sin. Just consider that it's your own sin. If you were the only person that ever lived, the Lord Jesus Christ would still have died for you. And just as I close, I just, I trust that you'll simply realize that as you get to Calvary and you picture the Lord Jesus dying on account of your sin, you'll simply just realize that it was for you. And you'll trust them as your savior today. I'm just going to read verse number five once more and I'll close in prayer. Verse number five says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Shall we pray? Our God and our Father, we thank thee again for another gospel message or another gospel meeting where we can sign forth the message of the gospel and we can tell sinners of their need of salvation. And it is our prayer and our desire that salvation would become real and there would be a reality to it to those who are not yet saved and those who are still in their sins. We would pray that this meeting might bear forth fruit and sinners might trust in the person of thy son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We commit this meeting to thee. We think of the gospel wherever it goes forth this afternoon and pray thy richest blessing upon it. And we pray that we might hear news of salvation, even for one soul this afternoon. We commend it to thee. We thank thee again for salvation and that's for the whosoever will. We commend this need to thee now and thank thee again for help to speak forth of thy son this afternoon in the, in the drive-in meeting. We commend this need to thee now and thank thee again for help in the Savior's precious name. Amen.